All right, well, welcome everyone to the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice uh, Town Hall on Fort Mose in St. Augustine. Uh, extraordinary story and extraordinary individuals who are working to let it be known about that fort. And I will turn it over to um, Matthew Rosen and welcome you all to uh, the Jacksonville Urban League and its Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. I want to um, especially um, thank the uh, interns of the center, including Matthew Rosen, who will be facilitating this evening and others uh, who are in attendance and others who are not, all of whom help the center uh, do what it does, work in the area of uh, social justice and advocacy, and also all the members of the Urban League staff and family who help us do what we need to do every day to help eliminate equity gaps, help those in need. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Matthew. All right, thank you, Dennis. Um, happy to have everybody here for the Fort Mose Town Hall. Um, and this is the 25th anniversary of the Fort Mose Historical Society, and it's an honor to have two founding members of that society, Thomas Jackson and Charles Ellis here to tell us about the history and sort of the, the story of the fort. And I really appreciate them uh, dressing up in the reenactment garb to sort of put that extra stamp on the story today. And then uh, later we'll have Julia Woodward from the Florida State Parks uh, Foundation, I believe Florida State Parks Foundation speak a little bit about a grant they are working towards for Fort Mose. So nobody came here to hear me talk. So I'll uh, pass it along to Thomas and Charles. Well, good evening. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Matthews, for inviting us. Uh, and to give us the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the Fort Mose Historical Society and also the, the Fort Mose story, which is uh, one of our prime uh, reasons for supporting the fort. And also uh, it is our signature that, that we put forth, forward on uh, promoting Fort Mose. Uh, just to back up a little bit, uh, I want to tell a little bit about myself. Uh, I, my name is Charles Ellis. I came to St. Augustine back in 1982. Uh, and when I came to, came to St. Augustine in 82, uh, uh, it was a very quiet little town uh, of about uh, 50,000 people. And, uh, you know, uh, and I guess more and more people found out about how, what a pleasure it is to be in St. Augustine. And all of a sudden now we're up to close to 300,000 people in St. Augustine. And my background is in retail. I was a store manager for JC Penney's for 35 years. And uh, recently, uh, I, uh, not recently, but I've been in real estate uh, for the last uh, 15 years. But my passion really goes out to um, uh, the story about Fort Mose. I joined the uh, Fort Mose organization back in 19, 1996. Uh, which was like 25 years ago. Uh, and it's been going strong ever since. Um, we, I think we have a story that is uh, virtually untold. And by having these kind of venues certainly gives us an opportunity to spread the word. Um, the museum, the land purchase was purchased back around 1988 and 1989. Um, the museum was built uh, in 2008. Jeb Bush was the governor back then. Uh, he came down on two, around 2006 and he, uh, and they did the groundbreaking in 2006. In 2008, the museum was open. Uh, and ever since that time, uh, we've had many, many uh, visitors to visit the museum and continuously, continuously, their question is, okay, I've saw, seen the museum, I've seen everything that's there. Uh, but you call it a fort. Where is the fort? Well, you know that's that's our that's our goal. That's our priority for uh, for 2022 
And of course, it's been our goal for the last 10 years. Uh, and we do a number of fundraisers to sort of try to get to that point. And pretty much that's where we are right now uh, with what's going to be, what Julie's going to be talking about. Um, Flight to Freedom is one of the things that one of the events that we have every year. And the society uh, is very, very much involved in that. That one of, one of the events that sort of jumpstart our year. And that's usually held the first of first weekend in February. Uh, and it's for three days. Uh, and it primarily uh, goes to, we talk about the educational components of Flight to Freedom. Uh, it is now in the history books uh, for fourth and fifth graders or it's a required history uh, for fourth and fifth graders. When we look, when we talk to the individuals around the city, state, individuals that visit us, uh, very few people know about uh, Fort Mose and also its history. Uh, it's such a passionate story until when people go out and they uh, visit the Flight to Freedom uh, event that comes on. It's amazing how passionately they come back after viewing, after visiting um, the, that event or that trail. One of the things that excites us about it is that uh, it's still a novelty. And the fact that it's still a novelty is that it give, it, we know that we have to continue to grow and continue to tell the story. Uh, and we have a uh, set of board member board members. Our board member consists of about 15 members. Uh, we also have uh, life members, and of course, we have life members of about 47 life members. Uh, we also have an advisory board of about 25 plus members, uh, and that too sort of helps us uh, get the word out. It also helps us to figure out how to continue to grow and tell the Fort Mose story. Uh, we have the militia. Uh, we have a militia who is headed by uh, uh, Lawson Dukes, uh, and they have muster the first Saturday of every every month. During that muster, that they get a chance to talk to all of the people uh, that come out and to visit Fort Mose, and also he gives them sort of a demonstration. So pretty much that's for the most part that's pretty much the. Uh, uh, background of uh, Fort Mose and the Fort Mose Historical Society. Uh, we have many um, committees that sort of help us to uh, target our uh, various uh, demographics or target the uh, visitors that come to Fort Mose and try to give them a, an idea of what it's like uh, at Fort Mose and also the things that are actually going on out at Fort Mose. Uh, we have the uh, membership chair, we have the uh, grant writing committee, we also have a militia, we have the uh, garden committee, and of course our garden committee is, that's one of the exciting things because they, what they do is talk about, what they do is to sort of grow things that sort of happen back around that 1738, 1740 period. So uh, it's, it's really exciting uh, just to be part of that, this organization and to really tell that story about Fort Mose and what it's all about. Uh, one of the things is that, and I, we, that we don't talk about enough and that, you know, it, it is a national historic landmark. Fort Mose is a national historic landmark. Uh, that in itself is a great, great honor to have that tag uh, to, your, uh, to your society. Uh, we're also a member of the UNESCO uh, slave route um, that we got that designation uh, around two, two years ago, uh, and also uh, really black, the Black uh, History Trail uh, for the Fort Mose Historical Society. So along with that, I'm gonna let uh, Thomas Jackson, who is our treasurer, uh, was our treasurer, he's transitioning to become our uh, vice president. So Thomas, I'm gonna let you turn it, let you take it from here. Oh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank, thank you, Matthew and Dennis, for putting this together. Um, as, as you see, this is what Charles was talking about earlier. Um, we are a um, site of memory associated with the slave route for the United Nest 
United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Um, we have quite a few designations that we really don't expound on or really uh, put out there that we are, but um, we want to make sure that after tonight, those individuals who are part of this presentation know what the Fort Mose story is about and what the work the society has been doing over the past, well, 25 years, basically. Um, well, just to let you know, my, my name is Thomas Jackson. Uh, as Charles and I have been founding members ever since 1996 of the Fort Mose Historical Society, and a society basically is to su help support the Florida Park Service tell the story of, um, of, of Fort Mose. Um, the, um, as the story of Fort Mose, most of you should know it, but if you don't know it, I'm just gonna let, kind of take you back. You just can use your imagination. We're going back to 17, 38, early 18th century. You're on the plantation in the Carolinas. You're working hard every day for the master. And of course, you might have a half a day on Sunday off, but basically you're working all day, every day. Now the master's son got sick a whole lot of hoopla going on up at the big house. All right, well, now is a good time for you to make your escape. And you're gonna go down to Spanish Florida where you heard that if you got to Spanish Florida, you could live free at this place they call Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose what we call Fort Mose for short. Okay, so now you leave the plantation. You, you, you hear this song being sung and you know now is the time to go. Now is the time to go. So it's time to steal away to Fort Mose. Now, when you make this trip, you're heading down from the Carolinas down to Spanish Florida. And that kind of mirrors a little bit of the Gullah Geechee connection that we are a part of that Gullah Geechee corridor, corridor. Now there was no I-95, there was no US-1. So to make your way down from the Carolinas down into Spanish Florida, you had to go through a lot of thickets, a lot of wilderness, uh, you had to, uh, to encounter the, um, the alligators, uh, um, bobcats, um, any type of wild animals along the way. And the only thing that you knew that could get you down to where you needed to go south was as you traveled at night and you were able to navigate by way of the stars. But then once you got to certain areas in your journey, you needed help. And that's where the Yamasi Native Americans came in. They helped you get and navigate your way around certain obstacles that you would have taken you maybe days, weeks, or maybe even been your demise if you weren't able to cross them. If you cross the river at the wrong point, you could get washed out to sea or pretty much drown. So the Native Americans were very helpful in helping you get down to Spanish Florida. Once you got down to Spanish Florida, you are probably got encountered a patrol that was patrolling for the Spanish government. And the this patrol would usually want to know whether you were friend or foe. They would ask you a question. Well, well, K Santos, what is this? The saint of the day. And any good Catholic would know the saint of the day. Now, that was back during that time. These times it's not as um, well known, but it was always a saint of the day. But for us, the saint of the day is always Santa Teresa, because that's the saint of Fort Mose. So the saint of the day, if you said Santa Teresa, then you were able to pass without being stopped and, and maybe even put into bondage. 
So once you got past the patrols and you got past with the Native Americans, you made your way into pretty much St. Augustine, the area around St. Augustine. Now, there were several ports that you would pass along the way. Um, if you came in from the uh, west, you would probably come in through Fort Picolata or Fort San Diego, um, and then of course, Fort Pupo. But these were Spanish out outposts that were to defend the city from the north. And of course, Fort Mose was the southernmost northern defense of St. Augustine. So once you got to Fort Mose, the able-bodied men would join the militia, they would defend the city, and all the inhabitants of Mose would become Catholic, which was the official religion of the Spanish crown. Now, most people say, well, religion becoming Catholic, that may be an undue burden, but it was a small price to pay at that time to have your freedom to be able to go and come as you would, as you, as you wish. And these freedom seekers, once they came to Mose, they lived at Mose free as long as they complied with those requirements of defending the city from the north and becoming Catholic. Now, uh, at Fort Mose, a major battle was fought in 1740, and it was fought against the British Army. And it was the first major defe defeat of the British Army in the New World. And that was at Fort Mose. Now, we reenact that battle every year in, the, in June. And we tell that story because basically those individuals who made it to St. Augustine and inhabited Fort Mose, they fought to the last drop of blood to defend the city of St. Augustine, but in return, they defended, uh, were also defending their freedom. So basically that's the story of what we tell. 1738 was the decree from Governor Montiano and it came from the King of Spain. But in order for that decree to be initiated, there was an individual at Fort Mose who was the captain of the Mose militia. His name was Francisco Menendez. He petitioned the governor to in turn send a, a request to the King of Spain to establish Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, which we call Fort Mose for short. But he was also the captain of the Mose militia and the head of the community at Fort Mose. Now there's a whole lot more I could say about him, but I know we got, we don't wanna have so much time, but I will, if you look up, um, if you look up Jane Landers is the author of a couple of books about Francisco Menendez. And she has done some, some extensive research on his life and the life he, he led once he left St. Augustine and went and joined uh, the rest of the inhabitants of Mose and, and, and the inhabitants of St. Augustine that went to Cuba. In 1763, uh, Spain ceded Florida to the British. So all the inhabitants of Mose and the city of St. Augustine packed up and moved to Cuba. Now in 1783, most of them came back. But that 20 year period, it was under British rule and where well, they destroyed Fort Mose, and um, well, that's another story. But we are we, and the 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 the, uh, the inhabitants of Mose for that period of time, 1738 to about 1752, lived free amongst the inhabitants of Saint Augustine, and of the inhabitants of, of Mose. So Mo Fort Mose was a bastion of freedom for that period of time. That was all the way up until 1763. So that's pretty much uh, a, a synopsis. There's more history we can delve into, but we can handle that during the during the Q and A, I guess, at that time. All right. Thank you both very much. I think I can stop screen sharing, um, and I think we can now pass it along to Julia uh, for the grant discussion. Hey everybody, my name is Julia Woodward. I'm the CEO of the Florida State Parks Foundation. We are a 
501c3 and the official support organization of the Florida Park Service. And first I wanna say thank you to Charles and Thomas. Uh, I always love hearing you all <laughs> tell the story of Fort Mose and that's really what got us as a foundation inspired to, um, to help fundraise for the Fort and hearing the story and the passion and the commitment from the Historical Society uh, it was just really awe-inspiring, and we recently have submitted a grant application through the Division of Historical Resources for a $750,000 grant to help rebuild uh, Fort Mose. And so we will be finding out about this. Um, it's a contingent upon legislative appropriation that would happen in the 2022 session, um, but we were excited about this opportunity that provided a one-to-one -one match. Uh, we were very fortunate to find generous donors in the area to help us put up that one-to-one uh, -one match, including the Jacksonville Jaguars, St. John's County, uh, the Florida Park Service, uh, the Community Foundation for Northeast Florida, um, Florida Blue, um, an, an individual donor, and um, some other smaller donors. And so, like I said, very um, hypothetical at this point, we'll find out about it um, in the spring. Um, well, first the committee meets in determines which applications they'll be moving forward with. And then those applications uh, would then have to get approved by the legislature. So a lot of steps we still have to go through to get the funding, but we're excited about hopefully making uh, this dream of building uh, Fort Mose a reality in the near future and um, have it for the community to enjoy. So thank you again to the Jacksonville Urban League for hosting us tonight. and for uh, Charles and Thomas and uh, Mark Giblin, the park manager is with us as well. And uh, Jane from the Historical Society, just everything that, that that park and the CSO is doing just is phenomenal and fantastic. Thank you very much. And then I think at this point, uh, we can open the floor to questions or if Thomas and Charles have any more uh, historical input they want to add, but if anybody has a question, feel free to either type it in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and say it out loud. Um, well, I would like to say that uh, it is our 25th anniversary. I think Charles did mention that. And uh, we are having our annual meeting October the 14th. And Jane Landers will be our speaker. So if you can't get a hold of her book between now and then, you can come and hear her speak at the annual meeting October 14th and go to Fort Mose, www.fortmose.org and get more information on that. Uh, Matthew, we also have Mark. I don't know whether Mark, you want to say something or not. Uh, he's our park manager for uh, Fort Mose and did, has done an outstanding job and sort of given us a lot of free range to sort of help support the park and and continue to build build on what's already there at the park. So if Mark wanted to say something when you hear, uh, Mark. Yeah, no, um, hi everyone. Um, you know, I'm just gonna kind of um, echo what um, you've kind of already heard from everybody in that, uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to, you know, be the park manager at what I feel is one of the most culturally significant historically called, you know, significant um, state parks and projects in, in what I think, you know, our country uh, to, to think of the, you know, um, you know, African-American history, what it means to, uh, you know, American history and what it means to, you know, the history of St. Augustine is just, I mean, uh, significant. And I think it's a story that uh, is not told enough. And, um, you know, I commend the Historical Society um, for all the work they've done. It is now taught in, um, in fourth grade classrooms all around Florida, which is unbelievable. And that's thank directly, you know, to the Historical Society's uh, push to uh, get that story out there. And then also thank you to the, you know, the foundation who has jumped on board to try to help uh, construct a fort and, and really 
you know, tell the story of, you know, in my mind and in, in, in many is what is the first, you know, really the first uh, recorded history of an underground railroad. And it led right here to Florida and right here to St. Augustine. So, um, you know, the, the historical significance of the site is, you know, just uh, it's amazing. And and thank you to anyone who, who chooses to help support uh, the mission of uh, telling that story. And uh, and uh, yeah, I uh, just appreciate everyone's hard work and dedication. Also, I'd like to say at this time also, uh, <clears throat> we had a meeting earlier today uh, with Mark uh, and along with uh, uh, Gabe at the amphitheater and looks like we're gonna have some entertainment coming up, coming our way uh, to, to also help support uh, our endeavors at the park uh, from the uh, amphitheater, uh, Mark. And so I know you've been really uh, working with uh, the amphitheater on that, on that behalf. And certainly it's gonna give us a little push uh, in terms of um, additional revenue. And I think having that come to that venue and sort of just gives us an idea of what all can happen out of that venue. And by doing so, it also uh, helps to tell the story because the more in events we can have out there, uh, the more people will be involved, the more people will know about Fort Mose. You know? So is there anything you wanna say about that Mark at this time or just? Uh, no, just everybody who's interested, stay tuned. It's going to be a pretty uh, significant blues and jazz festival that's going to be held at uh, Fort Mose. And so uh, focused around the history. And uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, things are starting to move in a very positive direction and uh, starting to gain some, some uh, you know, statewide and national attention, which is um, always good for um, getting the story of Fort Mose out there. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, one thing I wanted to mention that I, I know uh, Mark mentioned it, I don't want it to get lost in the uh, uh, conversation, but the, uh, the Underground Railroad came south long before it went north. And that was taught all throughout uh, elementary, middle school and high school history books of the Underground Railroad heading north up into Canada. But the Underground Railroad initially came south into Spanish Florida long before it went up north. And those are the kind of things that we as, I guess, uh, historians of, of hobby historians, or, you know, uh, historians who not, we take, we take history seriously. We like to tell the story the way, the way it is being told the way it was basically. So those kinds of things that we once we can document them and make sure that they are accurately you know, passed on information, then we can have a better understanding of the complete history. Because you know, when you are, I know a lot of times when I talk with uh, some of the uh, groups around, I'll tell them that, you know, there's a, there was always, when something was going on downtown, you know, there was always something going on uptown. And there was something going on overtown. And there was something going on out in the West. So those kinds of things, if you can get an accurate picture of what was happening at that time, you'll get the whole story. And that's one thing that as, as in, um, keepers of the story of Fort Mose, we want to be able to tell that piece. So it'll kind of give you a, a, an idea of the whole story that was going on at that time. Great, thank you. And then I have a question for myself. With the fourth grade classrooms learning about Fort Mose in Florida, are there field trips planned? Is that something that would maybe come to fruition after the fort is rebuilt? Is a plan to sort of teach this as maybe a, a hands-on experience rather than just in the classroom and they can go witness it themselves? Well, now you yeah, know. I'll, I'll, um, if you want, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of field that one. So um, yeah, we already currently host you know, a minimum of 30 field trips a year, a minimum. Um, the biggest gathering of school groups is during the flight to freedom event that the society holds. And during that time, there's, there's probably, you know, at least just during that time, I'm way underestimating here, but, um, you know, 
there's probably at least 30 to 40 schools that come come through on that two to three day stretch uh, just for the flight to freedom, which is an amazing event, which highlights you basically walk through time and walk through and, and get one on one. Mm. through there and it's an amazing event to see you know those little kids uh, get immersed in that is awesome so that's just those there's a week, like i said at least 30 school groups uh, and they range not just fourth graders there's colleges that will come through with students and there's high schools and, and elementary schools so i mean realistically with you know pre-covid you know minimum of 30 but year round probably you know at least four so that's kind of already happened um, now. All right, that's very good. Thank you very much. And then uh, Monica texted a question in the chat for anybody who can answer. How can advocacy, advocacy groups such as Jacksonville Urban League help bring awareness to important historical sites such as this one in the future? You know, one thing about the Urban League in Jacksonville, especially, they were instrumental in helping to uh, get the traveling exhibit um, moved around the city of Jacksonville. I know there was a couple of folks there uh, that who helped. Um, that helped quite a bit. But the the but the Urban League, if they spread the word around, become members, and also um, tell the tell the story, that would be a a great service to the society. Also, to, to add to add to that. <clears throat> When you look at the venue that we currently have out there, uh, we have a venue that lends itself uh, to a number of uh, type of events that you can have on the grounds out there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a we have we have weddings out there. Uh, we have family reunions out there. So anytime that uh, we can uh, have it, uh, a group to come out and put on an event out there, uh, it certainly enhances the opportunity. Of, of getting the word out. Uh, and uh, the Urban League, I think that is certainly an opportunity for us if they want to come down and maybe have an event uh, at uh, Fort Mose, uh, which would sort of help spread the word as well also. You know, just an interesting side note, I'm not sure how far the this our production is gonna go out, maybe to other Urban Leagues. But uh, there was a young lady by the name of uh, Michelle Miller who visited us and just before we broke ground on the property. And she's worked, she's with CBS News now. But I don't know if you know that her husband is Mark Muriel. Now he is the executive director for the Urban League. So if anybody in the Urban League that uh, can get word up to Michelle Miller and Mark Muriel, maybe they can come down and visit. But anyway, we, we definitely would like to uh, get the word out as much as possible. We have some, uh, we are, we're part of, we're actually in the city of St. Augustine. The property is owned by St. John's County. It's managed by the state of Florida, but it's also a national historic landmark. And then we have the international designation. So we wanna get the word out locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally all over. Once once that is done, then I think we've our work as a society has been not in vain. Thank you. And then um, floor is open if anybody wants to to jump in with any questions or comments, or if we want to keep talking about the even the history a little bit of uh, Francisco Menendez or, or some other topic that comes up, we can go over, go over <laughs> yeah, that as well. well. Francisco Menendez, I mean, that, this is something I've been wanting to tell you about him though, but the thing is, Francisco Menendez was a corsier. And you know, he was actually captured and sold into slavery three times. I mean, he made it, he fought against the British up in the Carolinas uh, and, and uh, he was actually, when he was brought down to the Car from the Carolinas to Spanish Florida, he, he actually escaped and made his way down here. Then he was sold into, he was actually tra uh, 
tricked and sold back into slavery uh, with the cacique called Mad Dog. Mad Dog actually you know, turned him in to the British and he was taken off on the ship and, went, and he escaped the ship, came back to St. Augustine because he felt comfortable living here. Um, while he was here, he, well, he spoke four different languages. He spoke the Yamasi, he spoke the English, he spoke the Spanish, and he spoke the language of his native language, the Mandinga. So he, he was a very a valuable interpreter during that period of time. So, and I mean, there should be a movie made about him, but you know, we got to get a, someone to write the script first. But the thing is, when he left and went to Cuba along with this, the, the inhabitants of Mo, Mose and the inhabitants of St. Augustine, we, lo we lost track of him in Havana. Now I can imagine a guy with his um, exploits and uh, you know the things that he did. You know, settling on a farm in Cuba was not something that he really wanted to uh, live out the rest of his days. So he's one of the one of the heroes of of Mose that we really want to try to find what happened to him and where he ended up. Um, but of course, we also have, and I'll be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, we have the ladies of Mose, because the ladies of Mose helped keep everything together while the men were out patrolling, training, fighting, and so forth. So um, there was a, a role for everyone to play in the Mose community, and that's something that we really um, would like to rep replicate. I don't know if you have that that um, picture, Matthew, that you can put up uh, of the Bose community. Um, this, that is something that really, it was the first line of defense uh, for the city of St. Augustine. And if any uh, enemy would have to get to St. Augustine, they would have to come through this particular community. And the community was uh, the, 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 right there at the um, where the San Sebastian River is to your west and the intercoastal is to your east, and you had to come right by Fort Mose. So those individuals that inhabited Mose would fight to the very end in order to defend St. Augustine, but also to defend their own freedom. Now, this is the artist rendition, uh, Nancy Christensen, who actually did the same artist rendition of the portrait that's behind me of the uh, park. Um, the museum at Fort Mose. She actually did this rendition of the Mose community. And that's something that, I don't know, Charles, you might want to mention a little bit more about the, how this was, this happened because this, you know, a lot of times when you, you got to have a dream and to make that dream a reality, you need to have some kind of bits and pieces to plug in there to make it, make it real. So. Yeah, well, it sort of goes back to uh, the, the event that we, <clears throat> our signature event that uh, Thomas has alluded to and also Mark alluded to, uh, Flight to Freedom, you know, that being our signature event. And of course, we only had about, you know, 10, nine stations. And of course, uh, by the time they got to, uh, got to the militia, well, okay, the next step was to, that's when they got their freedom and when they saw the priest and all that. But then what happened after that? Uh, that was not part of our original uh, uh, script. So mm -hmm. this script here has been added. And what, it, what this right here depicts is it depicts life after they got their freedom and what happened in the community and what the community was like. And we wanted to make sure that uh, our visitors and, and everyone that came to uh, to uh, visit uh, the museum and the fort, got a chance to see what uh, life was like uh, after they made that perilous journey, you know, that 377 miles from uh, Charleston down to St. Augustine. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about that quite a bit, but this right here sort of illuminates what it was like after they got there, once they got their freedom, and once they were able to settle down and, all, and like Thomas mentioned, you know, but the militia uh, were the ones that uh, was in the mil military. Uh, the women came and they, they did their, uh, 
growing of, of the vegetables and gardening uh, and taking care of the children. And so this, in my opinion, sort of gives a conclusion or brings it totally 360 after that perilous journey. And we also we also want you to know where the fort is, but we we're kind of focusing more on a community more so than just the fort. Right. Right. Uh, I would also say that you know, folks, you know, why why should someone come to uh, Fort Mose uh, other than just history? You know, there is a there's so many things that happen out at Fort Mose uh, that we have going on right now and. You know, when we look at uh, the, uh, we have the monthly muster that come, that happens at the first of every month. Uh, we have also uh, the uh, the flight to freedom, which is our first event that take that kicks the year off. Our second event, which is Founders Day, uh, that sort of depicts the time when Fort Mo Fort Mose was founded, uh, and then right after that, well, it kicks in. That's when we have the Battle of Buddy Mose. Um, that's held in June, as Thomas mentioned earlier. And of course, after that, you know, we have our annual meeting. But after that, the next big event is our first harvest. That first harvest is what happens like, you know, once they have come to Fort Mose and settled in, and I think at the end of the year uh, that they had their big feast and they want to have the big harvest and celebration of being, having their freedom. And so those are the four events that we have each year, along with uh, some play days for the kids that we have out at the park out there. Uh, also, we have, uh, like I said earlier, you know, it's a great venue for weddings. It's a great venue uh, for family reunions. Uh, and also while you're there, and right now uh, we're in the process of almost having Flight to Freedom, you know, 12 months out of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. with this new in interpretive uh, signage that we're putting on the trail. So someone that may have missed the actual reenactment uh, in February, well, they can come back at other times and go down that trail and they're going to be uh, uh, interpretive uh, pieces along the way that talks about everything that happened during that long journey from the Carolinas down to uh, La Florida. So that's coming and that should be that should be live probably within the next, I say six to eight, six to eight months. Yeah. Weeks. You say six to eight weeks, right, Joe? Uh, well, six to eight weeks. I'm I don't know, I don't know the exact time. So I, I know they've got okay. everything in line. I don't know what the oh, okay. time date is, right? Yeah. We had Carter. Carter was on a little while ago. Uh, I don't I don't know if he's still there. Carter, are you still there? Are you still live? Yes, sir, I'm here. <laughs> I wanted, wanted, wanted to, uh, to introduce Carl also. Carl is a key player. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, getting this, this fort built, and we told Carl, you know, we need to have this fort built. We need to find somebody that can build it for us. And so Carl jumped on, and uh, I tell you what, uh, he lit a fire on everybody that he came in contact with because he felt like it's a story that has to be told, should be told. And as many people as we can get should tell it. And uh, so he was our campaign manager for this fundraising event uh, to, matter of fact, he was our first contact to make contact with the Jaguars. And I'm gonna let uh, Carter just say a few words because here again, he's the one that sort of lit the fire. And so uh, we thank him for being on board and being part of the uh, Fort Mose family. Carter? Okay. The, uh... My, to me, Fort Mose is one of the single most important sites in what is now the continental United States. It is huge in its national and international importance as it was the very first free ground for formerly enslaved people. And it became a symbol of something that they could go for and, and, and go to a place that was free. And the, the scholarship that exists around this, the potential for scholarship and for people to come here and study and study about Francisco Menendez, uh, the Mandingo uh, warrior who was here and, and, and was a huge, uh, the story of him is so large that it takes a while to comprehend what it is. And, and, and you just have to think about it and imagine what it's like to come 
across the woods through the swamps of South Carolina and, and, and with, with, with people chasing you in the middle of the night with no food and no shoes and nothing and get here, lot, most of the people didn't make it. And the reality of what Fort Mose is in the world and on internationally as a site is, is, is so big, it's hard to put it into words. And uh, I spoke, uh, we, we, we contacted the Jaguars because it's, it's logical as warriors, as a warrior culture that the Jaguars are, that they would be the logical people to help us get the word out about this. And they've, they've stepped up and, and just the, you know, the, the meetings we've had with them and the association that we've had with them has been extremely helpful for us uh, from a business point of view and understanding uh, what we need to do to to present ourselves in a way so that we can go out and attract all the the uh, the uh, uh, sponsors that we're going to need because it's going to be a mutual event and it's going to be a community event. But the excitement level of what the reality of Fort Mose is, and I and, and I'm I'm just so so excited about the reality of 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 what it is that we just need to articulate this story and get it out because once the word is out on this this is going to become a destination for people from all over the world there's going to be a flood of people coming here once 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 the reality of this truly gets expressed so mm -hmm. that's where we're that's where i'm coming from on this thank you carter okay now, carter thank you, you you, Go ahead, Thomas. Sorry. No, I was just going to say you, um, a former professional football player. Aren't you? I got drafted by the Cowboys in 1968. So, so, so the and and the, the people that we played with, and, and you know, I mean, I know, I I understand the culture, and I understand the thinking, and I understand that a lot of these guys that are playing on the Jaguars are big, strong, smart, powerful mm -hmm. people. And they're the ancestors. Uh, a lot of these guys are coming from the South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia area. And, and, and I mean, and it's not just on the Jaguars either. It's the whole yeah, NFL. I, I, I mean, these guys are big. These guys yeah, are warriors. I just wanted to. I just wanted to mention that fact. But, but I think you. You know, you are doing a great job as a promoter as well. So, you know, that that is great. We appreciate everything that you're doing for the society. Thank you, Matt. All right. Well, it's an mm -hmm. honor. It's it's an honor to be associated. And, and, and what's remarkable is that it's here and it's relatively uh, unknown. I mean, it, we're as mm -hmm. big as Plymouth Rock, and, and or you, there's not a place that I can think of mm -hmm. in this country that is any more important than Fort Mose. And we have an opportunity now to get the word out because it's it's relatively unknown. I mean, it it hasn't even been in the history book. I never heard of it. When I was a kid, James Bullock came here. He never even heard of it. It's well, I was born and raised in St. Augustine, and uh, you know that's I got. I didn't know about Fort Mose until I went off to college. It's amazing. Uh, you know, we had some uh, we had some stories that were told, uh, especially during like when we when we used to dress up for Easter parades and Easter Sunday, we would go down to the Castillo de San Marcos, and uh, some of the older folks in the community would say. Well, you know, we had a fort too. And I would be kind of reluctant to embrace that because I didn't say, well, no, we're not. Now, why would they give black people a fort with guns and cannons and so forth? But then when I went off to college, I was in a history class and Professor Eton uh, from Florida a &M University, he said, uh, where are you from? And I told him, St. Augustine, Florida. He said, have you ever heard of Fort Mose? And I said, no, sir. And then he said, well, when you come to my class the next time, you need to tell me something about Fort Mose. So I did a little research and found out a little bit of information just to get him off my back, basically. But I did, that was just, you know, as a freshman in college, you have other things that you're more interested in. But anyway, I, when I got back to the home and found out that they were trying to save Fort Mose, it, came, it dawned on me, a bell rung, and I said, wait a minute, that's what Dr. Eton was telling me about. So, that's what kind of got me inspired to, to go, go in and look, do as much as I can to make sure that every kid coming out of St. Augustine, St. John's County 
Don't go off somewhere and learn about learn about Fort Mose from somewhere else. And Amen, I man. I mean, it's just thank God for you and Charles and you, you, the board and the people that are. I mean, it's just astounding that it's so it's so little known. Not that it's not yeah. unknown. There's a lot of people that know, but I mean, it's not oh, yeah. it's not up there with the Alamo. And we're bigger than the Alamo. We just don't know about it yet. So you no, know, we've been trying to tell Jamestown for the longest that the first yeah. Thanksgiving was here in, in Florida. That, rather, that's what our first harvest is all about. And of course, when he, when they came out with the 1619 story, oh, that's important, very important story. But uh, we were probably in urban renewal in that period of time. But and St. Augustine was a cosmopolitan city at that time in uh, 1619, 1620. But anyway, that's a that's a story for another day. And it's exciting about the possibilities of the guy, of the people, and the, the doctors and the PhDs that are going to come down here and start studying this. And we're going to find out about this. They're going to get this done. They're going to. The information is there, but nobody's really dug in there except Jane. And uh, and Kathy Deegan have have, have done it, but uh, there, this is just we haven't even scratched the surface on this man. I mean, right. this is a huge opportunity for all of us. So anyway, and Dennis raised your hand if you have a comment or question you wanted to add. Yeah, I may be uh, getting into territory that I I shouldn't, but uh, so Menendez. Uh, was charged with bringing um, uh, missionaries to Florida to counteract the Huguenots that were, were here. And um, I'm wondering if you've had any common ground with the uh, Diocese of St. Augustine, who is, the, the, uh, they're currently attempting to get sainthood for, um, native peoples who were um, martyred uh, by the British. Um, and uh, it seems to me there's a lot of common ground there between uh, the, uh, the Blacks that came on the Underground Railroad to Fort Mose, uh, having to become Catholic, and then the, uh, the native uh, indigenous peoples uh, around St. Augustine who essentially did the same thing. Um, uh, and I know there's quite a few historians working on that at Flagler and other places in, around St. Augustine. Just curious, is, has, have you uh, really talked to anybody about their work? And there may be a lot of common ground there. Yeah, we funny you should mention that. Um, we have reinstituted our Speakers Bureau. And um, our Speakers Bureau is going to kick off in January 2022. Now, first speaker is Dr. J. Michael Francis. Now, Dr. J. Michael Francis has done extensive research in the Catholic archives. And he's uncovered one little bit of information he uncovered was the first um, marriage in St. Augustine, 1566, was of a Spanish soldados and an African woman. That was the first uh, marriage that was um, taking place in St. Augustine, and, the, and it was recorded in the Catholic archives of the Diocese of St. Augustine. So yes, that, and that's the run, a, a main reason we were able to uh, document a lot of what happened at Mose was through the Catholic archives as well as the mm -hmm. Spanish archives in, in Spain. Uh, Jane went to Spain and did extensive research over there and well, she came back with a wealth of information, but also um, Dr. J Dr. Francis, he went over and he actually uh, interviewed the family of Pedro Menendez, the Avales, which is the um, so-called founder of St. Augustine. And I say so-called because St. Augustine was, I guess this, the town and the people were here already, but he was established St. Augustine pretty much. So, so he's done research over in, in Spain, uh, talking to his, his family and he's gotten um, letters that 
Pedro Menendez wrote back to his family in Spain. So there's quite a bit of research going on and hopefully in January, he may have some more information he can impart to us. And that's for part, uh, now Speakers Bureau is gonna be, he's gonna speak in January. In March, we're gonna have a maritime and, and um, um, archeological um, research with Kathy Deegan and, and Dr. Chuck Mead, who's at the, uh, um, over at the um, Lighthouse Museum. And then we're gonna have, um, finish it off in May with Dr. Uh, Dixon, who talks a lot about the Maroons who actually didn't wanna come into St. Augustine and be a part of Mose that wanted, that didn't, didn't wanna become Catholic and defend the city. They left and went into the hinterlands and joined the Native Americans. So mm. it's kind of a timeline type thing. We're gonna hopefully do that January, March, and May. And just whatmose.org, keep your eyes open for that. That's, we're gonna reinstitute that Speakers Bureau. Yeah, well, just a comment, you, you may wanna play, pay close attention to the development of the sainthood of these native, these indigenous peoples that is currently going on, because I know they're they're um, finding a lot of uh, journals that the Franciscans sent back to Spain. It could be very helpful in uh, the history of uh, Fort Mose. Yes, a doctor, um, the doctor at Flagler College. Um... Oh, if I can't remember his name right now, but he ended up, he found a Tamukwan catechism. Yeah. Yes. yes, right. And that it's, was one that was one way of translating the Tamukwan language into Spanish. Right. It's one of the only languages uh, that was, the native languages that was written. And it was, I think it's the only one that translated the Bible uh, and the catechism uh, into a native language here in this. Uh -huh in this uh, continent. So wow. it's really interesting. <clears throat> I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, I'm on a committee with him and, uh, and I should, we, we're we looking to do some research on um, some other things, but that, and uh, he's on a committee for the uh, Persia Shepherd Award, which Fort Mose Historical Society is um, getting that award in October. I had another question. And that is after the, uh, uh, the, the British took over uh, Florida uh, after the treaty, um, uh, it, it, from what I've read, there are about 3,000 um, African descendants um, in, uh, or emigres, let's call them forced emigres uh, in the St. Augustine area. Um, some of them, I think, as you were pointing out, left for Cuba, mm -hmm. but I, I assume some stayed behind and uh, toughed it out. And uh, there are descendants of those peoples, and maybe you're one of them, uh, in St. Augustine now. I have not researched my lineage that, to that extent. Mm -hmm. but I I wouldn't think that it would not be on the possibility that if you know they were asked to get on a ship to go to Cuba, that they remember getting on a ship to come here. So it's like, well, why do I want to get and go on a ship to go to Cuba? I might be going somewhere worse. Right. So, yeah, uh, but I do know quite a few of my friends growing up that. Um, really traced their lineage back quite a bit. I know too, there's one friend of mine who's um, traced his lineage back to uh, Antonio Proctor, who was awarded a land grant in the first Spanish period. And he defended that land grant during the British period and then was uh, reinstated during the second Spanish period. Now that's Proctor family is really, um, famous for, well, one, one of his sons became a state legislator and fought the battle against Alabama buying West Florida, which is, that's another story for another day too, but that's doing the, we've been talking quite a bit about the 200th anniversary of St. John's County. And that's part of that 
West Florida, East Florida story. But I would think that that his family actually stayed behind to kind of look out for his land grant and mm -hmm. didn't get on the ship to go to Cuba mm -hmm. and just abandon it. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to cut any, anybody off, but we're at 6 p.m. So I was going to hop in and just say, I wanted to thank everybody who came and especially those who spoke. Um, I think Julia said she had to hop off. She sent me an email, but to Thomas and Charles especially and, and Carter, thank you for your input. I think this was very educational for me. I hope everybody else enjoyed it as well. Um, and and I, just, I really appreciate it. I see Richard Danford is on the list. I'm not sure if he's available. But Richard, would you like to say if this is the president of the Jacksonville Urban League, uh, are you available to speak? Mm. Well, if he is not, I will uh, thank all of the speakers as well. And uh, rest assured that we will spread the word and uh, Look forward to working together on your project, both in St. Augustine and here in Jacksonville. Uh, you hey, know, Dennis, we... I am. I oh, am great, Richard. great, Richard. Sure, good afternoon. Uh, I did have a question for Thomas. Uh, whatever happened to Eric Dittus, a friend of mine that uh, I believe did some work with you guys uh, before he left town, are you, is he still around or are he gone? You know, Eric was with us for a while and he worked with the society. For, but I, I, I know he had to leave for employment purposes, but I don't have him heard back from him. I assume that he's coming back. Maybe Charles, maybe you've heard something. Uh, you remember Eric? Yeah, no, I haven't, no. Okay, okay I was... <laughs> Just curious, uh, a great presentation. Uh, I certainly learned quite a bit. Uh, I'm gonna thank all of the participants uh, this afternoon uh, for your participation and uh, certainly our interns. And we look forward to continuing to support Fort Mosaic. You guys have a, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I would like to say one other thing. Yeah, we'd like to invite all the young people well, well, just the young people to come down to Fort Mose and be part of uh, our volunteers. Uh, we're certainly looking for volunteers to come down and visit the fort and to work with the society. We'd love to have you. Uh, and that way you can sort of help us spread the word as well also. Also, I'd like to also stress the fact that we have membership and for those that want to become members and we'll get our newsletter on a regular basis. So uh, we send our newsletter out quarterly. So uh, those opportunities are out there. So. Again, I want to thank you also for having us and giving us the opportunity to, uh, to get the word out about uh, Fort Mose and, and what it's all about and to make, let, it, let people know, let it be known that it is part of our history. So again, from Fort Mose Historical Society, uh, I want to thank you again Ellis. for the opportunity. Mr. Ellis? Yes, yes. This is Deborah Thompson. I'm also with the um, Urban League, and I just want to let you know that my family and I used to come over to the reenactment of Fort oh. with Robert Nimmons over there and um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Greg um, White. Greg White, yes, 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 right. Well, good, good. Yeah, I remember your work with the CRA. and. Um... Yes, yes, Mr. Jackson. Thank you so very much. Okay. Enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And I came over and made a radio presentation about the Urban League and his entrepreneurial program here um, last last um, last fall, I think it was, with Robert and um, um, over at the center. Oh, Dw Dwala Willis. Dwala Willis. Right. 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 Yeah. Yes. Right. Oh, really great. Cool. Well, come back. Come back to see us again. Okay. We'll we'll do it. Thank you. Small world. Well, you all, everyone have a great evening and a thank great you, rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew, thank you. Right. And thank you, everyone else. Thank you all very much for coming. All right. Thank you.
Okay.